Welcome to Game Hacking 208. In this video, I'll show you how to reduce the amount of damage the player takes when health is an integer. And what we're looking at is damage reduced to one tenth of what it normally is. And here's normal damage. But alright, let's get into it. And as always, I'll skip over the details on things already covered in previous videos in the series. So if you're new to all this, or if you start to get lost in this video, you should go back and watch the previous videos. But okay, I've got the cheat table we were working on last time in Neo loaded in Cheat Engine, and in the God Mode and One Hit Kill script, I've got some comments in blue to help describe what's going on in the script. And as a reminder, the script is injecting our code right here, where health is getting subtracted by damage, which is normally the perfect place to insert code for damage modifiers. And keep in mind, all this code will run when the player or an enemy takes damage, and since our scripted code is right in the middle of this, it will affect both the player and the enemies. So in the script, I'm using this reference to create two distinct paths. One for the player, where the value of max health is getting placed into the current health address, and one for the enemies, where the damage they receive is being multiplied by a symbol that we can control in the address list. Alright, so let's delete the two lines giving the player infinite health and start working on reducing the amount of damage the player takes. And to do that, I'll be using the idiv command, which is short for integer division. Now, this command can be a bit tricky. It only takes one operand, but it has some hard-coded operands that the CPU uses behind the scenes for the division, and the operands actually change depending on the value size of the operand you use with the idiv command. And to understand what that even means, we need to take a more detailed look at some of these CPU registers we've been dealing with since the start of the series. And what we're looking at right now are some of the registers in a 64-bit CPU. And unless your computer is over 15 years old, the chances are pretty good that you have a 64-bit CPU in there. Now, I know we haven't talked about bits yet, and while I'll be covering them in detail in another video in the series, here's a quick overview. First, bit is just a shortened word for binary digit. And a binary digit is a member of the binary number system, which consists of only zeros and ones. Now, this is the true language of computers and what they best interpret. But this is kinda hard for us humans to understand, so a few smart ones created a counting system for the bits when grouped together, and decided to create something called the hexadecimal system to correspond to all the potential values of a group of four bits, which is called a nibble. But a nibble can only represent 16 different outcomes or values, so two nibbles were then grouped together to form a byte, and if we take another look at the cheat sheet from Game Hacking 204, we can multiply the number of listed bytes for each value type by 8 to determine how many bits are associated with each value type. And notice that 8-byte integers and doubles have 64 bits, which we were just talking about over here with the 64-bit CPU. Now, the registers on the left are known as the General Purpose Registers and are used to store memory address references and other data from memory, and also are typically used to perform operations on integer values, while the registers on the right cannot hold address references at all and specialize in performing floating point operations and performing operations on multiple different values at the same time. But since we're talking mostly about integer arithmetic in this video, we won't get into much more detail on the XMM registers since we typically won't see them used for that. So let's get these out of the way for right now, and what we're left with are 64-bit registers which can hold values within the 8-byte value range. But we don't always need all that space in the register. For example, in NEO, health is a 4-byte integer, which at most would only ever take up half the space in one of these registers. And in a lot of 64-bit games, you'll often only see the lower half of the register being used for instructions when they only hold a 4-byte value. And each 64-bit register has a specific 32-bit register name that refers to the lower 4 bytes of the register. And let's head back to our cheat sheet and add these in. Okay, and the smaller value types also have registers for them. Here are the ones for the 2 bytes, and here are the ones for single bytes. Now, it's important to realize that the 4-byte, 2-byte, and byte registers refer to specific sections of the 8-byte physical registers that are in the CPU. These sections never move and are all the same for most of the general purpose registers. Alright, before we move on, it's pretty critical that we know how instructions affect the registers of different sizes, so let's run a few and see what happens. So in the first instruction, the register is filled with 5s, which makes sense. And here, the last two digits are the lowest byte was changed. 
And with this one, the higher byte to the left was affected. And here, all four digits in the two byte register were changed. Now, this time notice that the entire RBX register was changed with the upper half of the register being filled with zeros. This happens for all 8 byte registers when instructions deal with 4 byte registers. And with this last instruction, even though we're only moving in one digit, the entire register gets changed to 8. And okay, let's get back to the IDIF command. The single operand we have control over can be either a memory address or a register. And like I mentioned earlier, there are two other operands behind the scenes that are involved with this command. When the operation is done with an 8-bit register or memory address as the operand input, the registers AHAL are used in compound as the dividend, while the given operand is used as the divisor. And the resulting quotient will get placed into AL and the remainder will get placed into AH. And yes, in integer division there are no fractions, so we'll always end up with a whole number quotient and a remainder. And this means if we have 1 in AH and 90 in AL, the dividend would be hex 190, which is 400 when converted to decimal. And if decimal 200 was in CL, this instruction would take 400 divided by 200, which would give us a quotient of 2 that would go into AL, and a remainder of 0 which would go into AH. Now, things get a bit different when we input an operand bigger than 8-bit. With a 16-bit operand input, the hard-coded dividend is DXAX, and the quotient goes to AX while the remainder goes to DX. And with a 32-bit operand input, the hard-coded dividend is EDXEAX, and the quotient goes to EAX while the remainder goes to EDX. And finally, with a 64-bit operand input, the hard-coded dividend is RDXRAX, and the quotient goes to RAX while the remainder goes to RDX. And if you're confused right now, don't worry, this should make a lot more sense when we actually do this in the script, so let's get to it. So the first thing we need to decide is what size integer we want to divide our damage by. To keep things nice and straightforward, it's usually a good idea to match the value type of what you want to divide. And I know damage is a 4-byte value because it's NEDI, which is a 4-byte register. And I'm going to specify the operand as a 4-byte by typing a 4-byte register. And there's no special reason I'm choosing ECX specifically. You can choose any register you want except for EAX and EDX because remember, they're hard-coded as part of the instruction. And we need to assign a value to ECX, and whatever is in ECX will be what the combined value in EDX EAX gets divided by. I'll just move 5 into it, just above the item instruction. Now remember that EDI is holding damage, so before the division I'll move the value of EDI into EAX, but I don't want whatever's in EDX to be combined with the damage value in EAX, because that would completely change the number that gets divided. So before the IDIV instruction, I'll move 0 into EDX, so when it gets combined with EAX, the damage value won't change. Now remember that after the division happens, the whole number quotient or result of the division gets placed into EAX and the remainder in EDX. And for what we're doing here, we don't care about the remainder, but we do need to move the new reduced damage back into EDI because that's what's being used down here for the instruction that's subtracting damage from health. Now, as far as dividing player damage is concerned, we're done. But we can't just run this right now because after the division, EAX, which was holding the current health value, gets cleared and replaced with the reduced damage. And also, we're replacing the values of EDX and ECX in our script, but remember, after the code in our script gets executed, the game is expecting to run the rest of its code as usual, and we have no idea what the game is expecting these registers to be. So before we change their values, we first need to save the values of the registers and then restore them to what they were before we change them. And one way to do this is by allocating a memory address to hold the value for each register we're changing, and you should be pretty familiar with this process at this point in the series. And as always, we need to deallocate the addresses under Disable. Now, I don't need to declare a default value for these addresses because the first thing I'm doing with them is copying the values of the three registers involved in our division into the addresses. And right after we copy the reduced damage into EDI, I'll restore the original values of the registers by retrieving their original values from the allocated memory addresses. And alright, a few quick notes about what I just did. You may have noticed that even though I'm using 4-byte registers for the IDIV instruction, I'm saving and restoring the full 8-byte registers. And that's because, as we saw earlier, an operation involving a 4-byte register clears the upper half of the 8-byte register. 
So if I only save and restore half the register, we'll delete whatever's in the upper half, and we might see some strange side effects or even crash the game. And keep in mind that we need to allocate 8 bytes for each memory address or they won't have the space to store all 8 bytes of the 8 byte registers. Now, I could just save and restore EAX since we see right here in the script that it's holding just a 4 byte value, which means the upper half of RAX must already be all zeros anyway. And the last point I want to make is that you'll only need to worry about saving and restoring the full 8 byte registers if you're doing this with a 64 bit game. And a dead giveaway that you're in a 64 bit game is if you see any registers beginning with an R inside brackets. And alright, again, I know this is likely the most complicated thing we've done so far in the series, so let's quickly recap what our script is doing one more time. First, we have five total memory allocations, one for new mem which will hold all the code that will be injected in the middle of the game's damage instructions, one for the damage multiplier that's also registered as a symbol so we can control its value in the cheat engine address list, and three to save and restore the three registers that are being used in the division of player damage. And in the code that will be injected into the game's damage instructions, we're first separating the player and the enemies with the value at this memory address reference, and the enemies are being sent to where the damage they take is being multiplied by the value in a symbol we control from the address list, while the player is coming down here to where the damage taken is being divided by 5. And the division involves EAX, EDX, and ECX, so we're copying their 64-bit register values into three allocated memory addresses before we do anything else with them. Then we're setting EDX to 0, so when it gets combined with EAX for the division, it doesn't affect the division at all. Then we're moving damage into EAX, which is hard-coded to hold the value that will get divided. Then we're moving the amount that we want damage divided by into ECX. And finally, we actually do the division which stores the whole number result into EAX and the remainder into EDX which we don't care about, and we then move the reduced damage back into EDI, restore the registers to what they were before we mess with them in the first place, then player health is subtracted by reduced damage, and then we jump back to all the normal game code. And alright, let's test this. And now uh, let's deactivate the script. And oh yeah, that's a big difference. And just like with damage, we can allocate another address, register it as a symbol, and then declare an initial value for the address and move that into ECX so we can control what damage gets divided by right from the address list. We've pulled off some pretty cool stuff so far, but this script still has a few issues. For one, it's not very streamlined as we've got some repetitive code and it's getting harder to keep track of what's going on with this script getting bigger. We've also traded in our infinite health for our damage reduction and it would be nice if our script let us actually switch between infinite health or the multiplier whenever we want it. But maybe the biggest issue is that if you give yourself too much defense, the player ends up not taking any damage at all. So if you haven't already, subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss any future videos. And as always, thanks for watching. See you next time.